Amen. So, um, so here we are, chapter 5, uh, looking at the, as it says in my Bible, in the ESV, uh, the handwriting on the wall. Uh, how many people here have heard of that phrase, the writings on the wall, which is probably most of us, okay? Uh, that seems to be a bit of a, a slogan that was almost spoke over my sort of life or use for me growing up. Well, the writings on the wall for this kid, and it, it's used to be uh, in judgment of the fact I was a bit of a bit of riffraff, bit of a riffraff growing up, bit of a hooligan. So I was always in trouble and my teachers would be like, well, you're going nowhere in life. The writing's on the wall for you. Uh, so, so nice positive uh, slogan that can be used for, for children to help them growing up, but they forget about it into their uh, later in life. They don't keep going on about it, what their teacher said about them in school. So nothing to worry about. But anyway, this idea, this phrase, the writing's on the wall. Did you know it comes from Daniel chapter five? If you didn't, you know now, okay? But there is lots more going on in Daniel chapter five than this slogan, the writing is on the wall. And I'm gonna summarize some of that for you. And I'm gonna do that using our home group material from an excellent resource that we use. And in it, it says, Daniel chapter five, it's broken down into four parts. And that's what we're gonna cover this morning by God's good grace. So verses one to four, it says that God sees our sins. Verses five to nine, for those of you that are um, our C type or whatever it is, and you like taking lots of notes, here they are. God confronts our sins, verses five to nine. And then thirdly, uh, verses 10 to 28, God exposes our sins. And then finally, verse 29 and 30 to 31, God deals with our sins. So God sees our sins, God confronts our sins, God exposes our sins, God deals with our sins. And maybe as you hear those sort of summarise, you're thinking, oh, well, I'm in for an absolute cracker of a service today. Can't wait to leave here feeling on fire and really sort of excited and joyful as we talk about all that's wrong with our life and sin and judgment and all the rest of it. And as we said a little bit earlier, I don't want to be that person that just unnecessarily points his little finger, his bony British finger and says, you lot shouldn't be doing this and you lot shouldn't be doing that. Listen, I'm not interested in judging people for the sake of it. I have been judged. I gave you an example there by my teacher and many times throughout my life, I've, I've felt the, uh, the, the, the negative sort of impact of being judged. But I've also been the person that has judged others, right? And I've looked back on my life and said, Jamie, you were just so judgmental in that moment. Or you've been so judgmental there. It's just wrong and it's disgusting. And maybe some of you can identify with that, what it's like to be negatively judged. And you've recognized that sort of bad trait in your own life where you've become very judgmental and critical of others. And so we know it's not a good thing and we know it's not a good virtue in our own lives. But we cannot get away from the fact that actually judgment is spoken of a great deal in the Bible. So in terms of, of church, we are, you're right, called not to judge people. Uh, that is something that uh, the Bible uh, asks the leaders to try and do, to, to judge the people right, to ju judge the flock right. But even then, uh, human leaders, pastors such as myself, are fallible and we make mistakes and we do it wrong and we should repent and ask God for his help. But we cannot get away from the fact that judgment and judging is in the Bible. So, uh, despite our modern attempts to get rid of it, the Bible is full of examples. God is described in the Bible, did you know, as being a judge. In fact, Daniel's name means God is my judge. So, you may be of watching the news fairly recently over the last week or two, and you've come away with a pretty dim view of certain judges, right? Because the sad reality is, even though God is described as a judge, we can have negative um, in, interpretation or experiences of, of earthly judges. And that is sadly the reality sometimes in our Western democracy, where we see bad examples of judges, unfair judges, judges that get it wrong. But again, coming back to what the Bible says and how it portrays God, it portrays God as this great, perfect, heavenly Judge, so in Psalm 9, it says, But the Lord reigns forever. He executes judgment from his throne. He will judge the earth with justice and rule the nations with fairness. So in the Bible, God is pointed as being a fair judge and a judge that rules with perfect justice. 
And then, of course, if we, some of us, the temptations might be, well, that's the Old Testament where it speaks about judgment and God judging, for example, some of these nations that Israel drove out. I mean, that's the Old Testament, Jamie. It doesn't say anything like that in the New Testament. I just want to follow Jesus and his example. But actually, if you go through the Gospels and if you look in the New Testament, it's Jesus who spoke about this coming judgment more than anyone in the whole of the Bible. In fact, Jesus spoke about hell then, then more than any other person. So we cannot, because of our negative experiences, throw away where the Bible brings up this topic of judgment and being judged. It is in the Bible, it is biblical, and so when we come to it, we shouldn't try and reinterpret it or skirt past it, but we should try to understand what it is saying. And when people say to me, actually, uh, just backtrack a little bit, I actually find... Uh, the topic, the virtue, the, the, this facet of God of, as being the great and awesome and perfect judge, actually deeply encouraging for me. And when people say to me, Jamie, where is your God? With everything that's taken place, if he is a perfect judge, why does all this stuff happen around the world? Why is there so much injustice happening around the world? And I take great comfort from the Bible in that I understand that whilst we might not see it here on earth, there is coming a day where God will perfectly execute his judgment. So everything that we've seen, every act of injustice, the unfairness we've seen in life, maybe we've turned on the news channels and we've, and we've read in the newspapers and we've seen the sick, evil, twisted heart of mankind and we've gone, how has that person got away with such injustice in this world? Well, the Bible comforts the believer and says, no, they will not. Because God is storing up righteous wrath and the day is coming when all will stand before him and they will be judged according to their deeds. And I take great comfort for that, knowing that vengeance belongs to the Lord. It's one of the great encouragements I have as a believer that not only is God a God of love, but he is also a God of perfect justice. The Bible clearly shows us that, not something to be avoided, but actually to embrace and love about God, that he is a perfect judge. We should, we should embrace that and love that characteristic of who he is. So, I don't believe then that it's judgmental to, uh, to say these things. I don't think it's uh, unloving to tell people that you need to get right with God because there is coming a day when you will stand before him on judgment day and those that love him and know him will be welcomed into his presence in heaven but those that have rejected him and those that have sat on the fence or are lukewarm or have never surrendered their life will be sent away to hell I don't think it's judgmental to say that because the Bible says that and Jesus says that and I don't think it's any more unkind or unloving than if, for example, you are out on the street and you see your neighbor's kid running out onto the road chasing his ball and you saw a car come in and you ran out and said, flee, get out the way, what are you doing? And you grabbed him and pulled him out of the way. I believe that's the way in which we should do, uh, view Judgment Day and hell in that we are called to warn people of the wrath to come, of that day. We are called as Christians to warn people and we do it not because we just want to wave our bony British fingers at people. We do it because we love them and we care for them and we don't want anyone to go to hell. So we warn them, get out the way of what's coming, turn to Christ, repent and believe. So Christians don't say this because they are angry and judgmental, but because they care where people will stand on judgment day and they don't want people to go to hell. Okay, but as many people say to me, and they have, but what is God judging me for? Well, for this he has given us what the Bible calls the moral law, aka the Ten Commandments. And so many of us would know that. Uh, Exodus 20, where it speaks about don't lie, don't, don't cheat, don't blaspheme, honour the Sabbath, honour your parents, don't cheat on your, uh, on your wife or on your husband. Uh, but let me tell you one, one law. Even if you have been faithful to all of those things. Let me tell you one law that no one has followed all of their lives and the reason why God must judge us because we do as Steve said we have all sinned we've all fallen short and therefore we must stand before God the judge but let me tell you one even if you've been perfect in all those ones I've just said it is this love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul and with all of your strength have you done that every day and every second of your life. And this preacher has by no means lived up to that. Spurgeon, interestingly, uh, speaking on this and using justice terminology, says this, 
I would have every man put himself into the scales of the divine law. There stands the law of God. The law is a balance which will turn even when there is but a grain of sand in it. It is true to a hair. It moves upon the diamond of God's eternal, immutable truth. I put but one weight on the scale. It is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And I invite any man who thinks himself to be of the right stamp and flatters himself that he has no need of mercy, no need of washing in the blood of Jesus Christ, no need of any atonement, I invite him to put himself on those scales and to see whether he is full weight. But there is but this one commandment in the other scale. And then, boom, down it goes. And so, God who is omnipresent and omniscient, because he is a loving God and a God of justice, he can't let this evil and this ingratitude go unpunished. And so he will bring about this great and terrifying day, Judgment Day, where this will be trialled. I remember in my, uh, in my last pastorate, I used to have a, uh, a set of scales by my, by my desk to remind me that not only do we preach that God is a God of love, but God is a God of, of justice. And he is the perfect judge so uh, we need to remind people of the fact that this judgment day is coming and that God will judge people according to their deeds it reminds me of a uh, of an encounter I had I shared this in my home group the other week about how I used to loving talking about Jesus wherever I go try and sort of open up conversations with the Joe public and talk to them about Christ I, uh, one of the ways I used to do that was I used to get an uber to to work okay and it was a great opportunity because uh, you were in a car and the Uber driver couldn't get away from you unless he opened up the door and kicked you out. You were generally had a captive audience. And I was quite happy for this man to sort of uh, drive around the block a little bit. And once when I got in the car, I was sitting in there. I think the guy's, I'm not, you know, stereotyping, but I'm pretty sure the guy's name was Mohammed. He was a Muslim chap. And I was sitting thinking, right, you're in for it, mate. Let's talk about faith. And we were just talking about it. And he was asking me questions. And I was asking, well, what do you think is going to happen to you on Judgment Day? Praying at the same time. It's one of the only areas in which I can multitask. So I was talking to him. And I was praying simultaneously, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me. And I was telling him about, so what do you think will happen to you? Should your life be demanded of you here and now and today? And as I said that, literally... And if you're a cat lover, cover up your ears. He ran over a cat in his Uber car. And I thought, right, perfect opportunity. What if you, like that cat, lost your life today? And we proceeded to talk to him about standing before him on Judgment Day and being prepared. Because none of us are. We live lives like we're going to live forever. Particularly if you're young people. We live like we're going to live to we're 90 or 100. And we can just get serious with God when we're older, right? I know that's what I did. But the Bible tells us that... You know, we should not take life for, for granted. You never know when your time's up and when you're standing before him. So great opportunity to speak about judgment based on a cat getting ro run over in an Uber car. Lovely analogy. In our passage today, we see a man by the name of King Belshazzar. I get this wrong, and I probably call him Belshazzar or something, but you know what I mean. Who 20 years after his granddad, King Nebuchadnezzar, finally bends the knee. That's King Nebuchadnezzar, okay, 20 years on from them. And this guy, though, lives like that day will never come, his grandson. So we are introduced when we turn to chapter 5 of him having a crazy party. And the fate of this party is that King Belshazzar, who is acting like a kind of, of regent in his father's absence, his father uh, Nabonidus is away, finding himself in other gods, and the army of Babylon, Babylon is about to be overthrown by Persian armies as they grow in size and power. And rather than take the Persian threat or his father's throne seriously, he's seen here, chapter 5, having an absolute blinder of a party. Now, whether he was being reckless or in denial, you know, like sometimes when we know something bad's coming our way, we just bury our heads in the sand and act like it's never going to happen. Nothing's, nothing's going on here. I'm just going to party through this and hope it all works out. That's exactly the attitude of the king. Rather than take the threat seriously or his father's throne seriously, he's seen here having a party. Okay. Clearly what the Bible is trying to show us here, again, is a contrast. Remember the last king that we looked at, King Nebuchadnezzar. 
who eventually, having gone back and forth, decides to, through God, humbly bow the knee, and he honours God. And that is in contrast now to his grandson, who, this proud young king, who's about to do something that not honours God, but dishonours God. So in verse 2, he orders that they bring in the gold and the silver vessels, ransacked by his grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar, from the temple in Jerusalem. These were temple items that you read about in Exodus that were described as being extra holy. Uh, so some of the men at the moment are reading through the Bible in, in a year. You might have covered this in the last week. I think that's where, about where it is. It speaks about them not just being holy, but being particularly, especially holy. And they were to be used in their worship to honour and glorify God. But Belshazzar calls them out so that in verse 4, they can use them to get drunk as a skunk and toast to their false gods. But what we see from our points today is this. God sees our sin when we mock his glory. And this is exactly what's happening here, verses 1 to 4. You see, that is ultimately what sin is. That's what we looked at this morning. Ultimately, what sin is. Sin is stealing something that belongs to God, namely his glory. All sin is theft in that we who have been made for God to live for God decide instead to give glory to ourselves rather than give glory to our creator. That's exactly what Belshazzar is doing here. He's using something that has been made to bring honour to God, the utensils, the plates and the cups, to not, not to bring honour to God, but to bring honour to himself. But what we see from the passage is God not only sees it, but number two, God confronts it. He confronts our sin. And when he does, we should tremble with repentant hearts. That's what you see at the end of the life of King Nebuchadnezzar, but you do not see it here in his grandson. Verses 5 to 9. How does God show up and confront our sin here in the passage. Well, terrifyingly, by showing himself in that famous scene where we get the phrase with the writing on the wall, he shows up and as they're all frolicking and getting drunk and there are concubines and all sorts of things going on, the record, if you like, metaphorically screeches to a stop and this deadly silence uh, falls down, descends, and this hand, with no body attached to it, just comes out of nowhere with a finger writing on the wall those famous words, if you know it, say it. Mene, mene. Thank you. Tekel Parson. Can you even put yourself in that picture and imagine what that must have been like? Now, perhaps we've all been in moments of our lives where we can remember and recollect things that just stopped us. And we were absolutely shocked at what is going on here. I bet, for example, all of us can remember when we turned on the TV channels and we saw the events surrounding the terrorist attacks on the trade towers during 9-11. And we were just stopped and we stared at it and we thought, what is going on here? Or maybe you remember that doctor's diagnosis or receiving bad news from a loved ones and you were just left stunned and speechless at what is going on here. That's what is being described uh, or being attributed to the countenance of the king in this moment. One commentator puts it like this. He said, this is the fastest account ever recorded of someone suddenly sobering up. He was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking, literally. It's really uh, quite humorous when you look up the original meaning behind this because actually, as I've described it there, that's really quite very English. It's far too polite to what the original text is saying. A more literal translation would be that the joint of his loins, use your imagination, were loosened. The CSB, which I like, says literally that he soiled himself. And it, you don't need any further translations on, on that, do you? And it wasn't because he drank too much or had too much spicy food that night, but because God showed up. And about the only one thing that Belshazzar, the party king, gets right in this passage is that he responds with terror and literally cakes himself. We spoke about cake. So, what about the writing on the wall? Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Well, the king is at a loss. He's so terrified. He does what his grandfather did and he calls for wise men. Do you remember in chapter 1? But they're about as useful as, think of something useful, that's not. Anyone? Got any jokes in here? Willie, usually, something like that. Submarine with electric windows. 
Okay, there you go. Thank you. Okay. So, so what do you do? What do you do when you've tried all that you can think of in your own mind, in your own strength? Everything therapeutic that this world offers, well, the king does the same in his desperation. He does what many people do. He turns to God, albeit indirectly through King Neb's wife. So when you pick up there, the queen, that's probably speaking of King Nebuchadnezzar's wife, who of course remembers Daniel and his ability to interpret dreams as he did for her husband. So they say, bring him out. And out comes Daniel. Maybe he's wheeled out because he's now in his 80s. Okay? And one of the questions I have is when Daniel comes out now as this old statesman, old man in his 80s, I wonder, will he show the same vigor and passion for the honor and glory of God as he did when he was in his teenage years? The king is young, he's volatile. He's offered Daniel a pretty handsome retirement package in verse 17. Who knows how Daniel will respond? Will Daniel assimilate? Will he conform? Will he give up? Now he's older. We've all heard of politicians that go back and do exactly the opposite to what they said and were passionate about when they were younger on ethical choices such as traditional marriage or abortion in their old age, don't we? How about Daniel? How is God's man going to react in his latter years? Answer, he will not assimilate. No, he will not. Daniel is the same person that we've read about in chapter 1 that was resolved in his heart that he will not compromise his faith nor will he do anything that discredits or brings uh, dishonour to his God and his, and his king. Anything that takes glory away from God. And in response to the king, who's verse 16, offered him third in command after his dad and himself, Daniel's response is simple. Do you see it? It's so inspiring. Offered with all the treasures of Babylon, you may keep your gifts and give your rewards to someone else. Oh, but I still tell you. And I find this an astonishingly good challenge. In a society where it can be about retiring as early as possible and living as comfortable as possible, Daniel isn't so bothered. He's not enamoured by earthly possessions. How many of us can honestly say that? That our heads aren't turned by these things. You know, many churches, they focus on young people, and I'm cool with that. But oh, how we need old, wiser men and women of God, the silver surfers and those with no hair, those who will have a heart for and be an example to young people, and those who have peaked and are on the way down the mountain, like myself and Willie, and definitely Steve. <laughs> okay. and, and here is my heart's... I didn't mean it, guys. And here is my heart's desire, not just for myself, but for all of you, from the youngest to the oldest in this room, like Daniel, you will remain faithful to the one who has redeemed your life from the pit and that you never lose your fire and your loyalty to God till the day he calls you home, even into your old age. And so old people see yourself as an example to younger people. An example here from Daniel, we've seen the example of him in his teenage years. Now here's an example for you in his 80s. Living faithfully and loyally and on fire for his king. So Daniel now is about to drop the truth bomb, isn't he? And it is this. Because of your pride... And because of your great sin of stealing that which belongs to God, he declares mene, mene, which means God has numbered your days and your kingdom has been brought to an end. Imagine scales. Tekel, which means you have been weighed by the divine judge on the divine scales and you have been found wanting. Parsin, which means your kingdom has been divided and shall be given over, we know, to the Medes and the Persians. And in keeping with Daniel's account, verses 30 to 31, according to the Greek historian Herodotus, that very night, Medo-Persian army, sensing an opportunity to exploit them in their drunken parties, decide not to try and go over the impenetrable walls, which were like 40 foot high and 25 foot uh, uh, deep, but to go under the tunnels, and they took the, uh, uh, the city of Babylon by surprise during this drunken party by going underneath the city and overthrowing this vile and proud Babylonian king. You see, God not only sees all sin, God not only confronts sin, but God exposes the sin of Belshazzar, and he, the divine judge of the universe, deals with sin on this earth or in the next life. 
And sometimes in his sovereignty, he chooses to bring about that judgment on earth as well as before he's thrown on judgment. And this should serve as a wake-up call, I think, for those of us who may be living a life of sin, that aren't fully surrendered, that haven't bowed the knee, that God sees. Now that's one short chapter given over to the last king of Babylon. A byword for all that represents that which is opposed to Christ and his kingdom. And now we shall begin to see how as God allowed the Israelites to be taken away for 70 years, how God is behind the scenes orchestrating how he's going to return all to the promised land as he ushers in the Persian king Darius. That's who we see next. And as we look to land chapter 5 and apply it to our lives, hang in there brother. Let me first speak to the unbelievers and the uncertains. Do you know that there is appointed a day when all people shall stand before God on judgment? You see, for some people, they view life just like King Belshazzar. They put it off, they party away, thinking we'll sort it out all about another day. But we just, as we've seen from the passage, cannot live like that. You sit on the fence And maybe you wait for a sign. You say, well, I will change my life and my attitude and I will surrender to God if I can see a finger writing on the wall. If God sends a hand right now into this church building, BIA, I would believe. If I saw a finger writing on that wall right now above BIA, I would bow the knee and I would surrender to God. You know, interestingly, this is not the first time we see the finger of God mentioned in the Bible. We see it in a few places. For example, Exodus 8.19, the Pharaoh's magicians acknowledge that everything that's happening is, the, this phrase, the finger of God. And then we see it at the end of Exodus, at the very end, in chapter 31, where we see the finger of God writing the Ten Commandments on those stone tablets. So it's usually a, 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 a surrounding circumstances that are pretty big and weighty. And you say, well, I want to see something big like that. That would make me change my heart and my mind. But brother and sister, do you know, do you know that God has shown us his finger? That God has not just shown us his finger, but he has shown us his hands. And God has shown us his whole body. And he has shown it to us in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth in the flesh. And you know what we did with those fingers and what we did with those hands? We nailed them to a cross. So God has shown us his finger. God has shown us his hands. And God has shown us through Jesus Christ. The Bible says concerning this Jesus in John chapter 3, and you know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. And we're very good at remembering those, that verse, aren't we? But keep reading, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, it says, verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, so that anyone who believes in him is not condemned and not judged. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. They are judged because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Verse 19, This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The finger of God, the hand of God, the body of God, Jesus Christ has come into the world, the light, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And we see that in the king who prefers instead to live in living evil. We know that. We know that because of what Jesus has done on Calvary. But let me now speak to the believers as we look to Lamb. Christians need not fear judgment day. Christians need not fear judgment day. That's what being saved means. Saved from what? Saved from judgment. That's what Christ has done for us. Now, does that mean we live recklessly like King Belshazzar? No. 10,000 times, no. But neither do we live in fear, you see, because Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law and the commandments of God and he always loved the Father and brought honour and glory, the things that we've stolen from him that are given to his name. He was able to come and be the perfect sacrifice on the cross for all of us that did not. We call that the divine exchange. Jesus, the one who is perfect, is punished for our sins, we who are unperfect. Jesus is crucified and put to death and we are set free. And called into his family. But let me also remind the believers of this charge against Belshazzar. Lest we fall into the same sin. Verse 22. He says, and you 
his son Belshazzar, do you see it, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. Verse 23, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of the heaven with what you did with those artifacts, remember. You've praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood and stone, which you do not see or hear or know. But the God whose hand is in your breath and whose are your ways you have not honoured. He has not humbled his heart. And we're all susceptible to this even as believers. He has not humbled his heart. He has worshipped other man-made idols and idols can be anything. But fundamentally he has sinned by not realising that the very things given to bring glory to God, he has ransomed. And he has used them to bring glory to himself. And this is the gut puncher for me that I am challenged by. Believers, do you, do you see it in the same way? Don't just say, this is the king in Babylon. It's nothing to do with me. The Bible has said that because, you, because of Jesus, you have now been made holy. And you have been set apart for the things of God. That you may bring honour and glory to him. And so I ask you not to make you fear God's wrath or to make you worry about whether you'll suddenly be scrubbed out of the book of life. If he's your Lord, then nothing can snatch you from his hand. But I say it to challenge you because you've been made for a purpose. You've been made holy for a purpose, to bring glory to God. You are his possession. You're called to bring glory to his name. Sin is taking what has been set apart for God and using it for yourself, just like the king. Now, many commentaries usually apply this to our bodies in a, in a sexual way, and rightly so. We've been made holy, and we shouldn't use our bodies in an unholy way. And God has given us the blessing of holy matrimony, whereby in a covenant relationship between God and a man and his wife alone are freely given the joy and gift of sex. And anything else, including pornography, or even looking with your eyes, or the intention of your heart, is stealing for the, from God to glorify yourself. It needs to stop. It's wrong. But let me push it further, because I believe that God wants surrender in every part of our lives. How about our finances, the ability to gain them? Do you know that it isn't there just to furnish your own lives, but a gift from God to bring glory to him? Did you know what uh, Malachi in chapter 3, 8, when God, God calls back Israel's holding of the tithes and offerings, he says, it's, it's robbing from me, because it's a gift given to you to not only help you with your life, but to... Give glory to God for our giving. And how about those gifts and talents that God has put in you? As I look around, I see so many gifts and talented people here. But do you understand that they're not just given to you to make a good living and to be comfortable in life, but to be part of the many parts that form the body of Christ? And some of you have been gifted in wonderful ways, whether that's administration or hospitality. Do you see these things that God has put in your heart? to be used for his church and to bring glory for God. Some of you have been given a heart for kids or young people. Are you using those things which God has put in your heart for his church to bring glory to God? Some of you God has made artistic and creative. And some of you God has given as acts of service. He's given you these gifts and these desires and you're using them out there. But did you know he's also given them to you? He's made that about you so that you can be many parts who form one body to help the body of Christ flourish. And I'm telling you now, brothers and sisters, as God grows his church here in Aloha Nani Church, we need you to understand that we're calling you, that no one here in the church is a spare part. All of you are a part of the body and we need your help and your gift and your talents to get on board with the mission of our church to bring glory to Christ on this island and to the ends of the earth. Don't rob from God what he has given to you. You are holy and he has gifted you amazingly to bring glory to his name. Sin is to take what God has made for his glory and to use it for ourselves. And that's the challenge I, I want to leave us with today. Don't do it out of judgment and out of criticism. Do it out of love and wanting to see the body of Christ flourish and be all it can be and for you to walk in that freedom and joy knowing that God loves you, you've been saved and now he has a part for you to play in his body for the glory of his name. But can I also finish by saying if you do not know these things, don't be like the young king who put them off, lived for himself, waited another day somewhere in the future but bow the knee, surrender to the good God of heaven, your creator who made you with the purpose of knowing him and loving him and walking with him.